Hi everyone, I'm Alex and you're on the iFace channel. This is the second episode of the video series Front End Interview Questions, where I'll do my best to answer the most common technical questions asked in interviews in a simple and detailed way. But before we start, I want to remind you that I have a website where all the questions are organized by topic, each with a corresponding timeline. This allows you to quickly review tricky topics or refresh anything you might have forgotten. Don't forget to leave questions you've been asked in interviews in the comments below the video. Let's go! We're starting with HTML. So, what is validation and what types of HTML document checks do you know? Validation is the process of checking a document with a special tool, called a validator, to make sure it follows established web standards and to identify any existing errors. These standards are called specifications, and they're created by the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C for short. Here's how a validator works. First, it identifies the document type, which is specified using the doctype declaration. Then, it checks the HTML code for accuracy and error-free structure, including correct tag names and nesting. Which tag should you use to create a button? It seems like a basic question, there's more to it than meets the eye. And the best answer is actually another question, what kind of button do you need? At this point, we either get clarification on the context, or we cover the different options. The first type is a standard button with functionality that can be added through JavaScript. For this, we use the button tag, sometimes with the attribute type button. The second type is a button used to submit a form. Here, you can use either button type submit or input type submit. While the input tag with a submit type is still relevant, it's considered a bit outdated. And finally, we have the button link. In this case, we use the A tag, which we then style to look like a button using CSS. What is an inline style and can it be overridden? An inline style is a style applied directly to a specific element. It is set directly in the HTML file and added to the tag using the style attribute where the desired styles are defined. An inline style can only be overridden with the important directive added to CSS properties. Do HTML elements have their own default styles? Yes. Almost every HTML element comes with its own set of predefined styles. For example, headings have larger font sizes, padding, and bold text. Lists come with default markers or numbers, and even paragraphs have extra margin by default. Some tags like B, I, S, and double T are specifically used just to style content visually. But here's the catch. These default styles can vary across different browsers. To ensure consistent rendering, what we call cross-browser compatibility, developers use either normalize CSS to standardize styles or reset CSS to completely remove all default styling. Which tag uses the alt attribute and why is it needed? The alt attribute or alternative text is added to the IMG tag. It's essential because if an image doesn't display on the page, for instance due to a development error or a service failure, a descriptive or alternative text will appear in its place. Firstly, this attribute is required. Any validator will show an error if it's missing. Secondly, using the alt attribute improves page accessibility, as screen readers read its content aloud when navigating the web page. This helps users with disabilities understand the context of the image. Let's move on to CSS. What is a selector and what types of selectors are there? A selector is a part of a CSS rule that tells the browser which element or elements on the web page should have a specific style applied. Let's go through the different selectors. You're usually not expected to list them all, but it's a big plus if you can organize them systematically. Selectors are generally divided into two main groups, simple and compound. Simple selectors are types where only one selector is specified, like a class, ID, tag or element type. This category also includes the universal selector, the asterisk, and attribute selectors. Compound selectors are combinations of simple selectors separated by spaces or combinators, special symbols between selectors. These include group selectors, listed with commas, descendant selectors, chained without separation, child selectors, indicated by the greater than symbol, as well as pseudo-class and pseudo-element selectors. As mentioned, there are many types of selectors, but knowing every single one by heart isn't necessary. What is selector specificity? How do you calculate selector weight? 
Specificity is the mechanism that browsers use to determine which CSS property values will be applied to an element. The thing is, multiple styles can be applied to the same element, and the ones that actually appear on the page depend on the specificity, which is based on calculating the weight of the selector. There are four main levels of specificity. Inline styles, the heaviest with a weight of 1000. ID selector, the weight of this selector is 100. Class, Attribute and Pseudo Classes. Each of these has a weight of 10. Elements and Pseudo Elements, their weight is 1. On the screen, you'll see two tables illustrating these weights. One shows the values as numbers, and the other shows the relationships between the levels. You can choose whichever version is clearer for you and remember it. To calculate the weight of a selector, simply sum up the weight of all its parts. For example, if the selector contains one tag, its weight is 1. If it contains two tags, the weight will be 2. If it contains an ID and a class, the weight will be 110, and so on. These calculations are useful for writing clean CSS code while minimizing the need for important. The difference between reset and normalize. Almost all HTML elements come with default styles, such as margins, font size and weight, and the presence of certain labels, among others. However, each browser applies its own default styles. To ensure consistent layout across different browsers, developers often use two approaches before starting, reset and normalize. These are CSS files that are linked at the beginning of the document. Reset either removes all default styles or resets them to zero, while normalize stabilizes and normalizes them, ensuring consistent display across various browsers. So, rather than removing all styles, Normalize keeps them, but makes sure they are the same across browsers. You can clearly see the difference in action on the slide. A disadvantage of using Reset is that it requires you to reapply some styles. The choice between the two depends on the task at hand. Currently, the most widely used approach is Normalize. Let's move on to JavaScript. The difference between Null and Undefined. Both values represent the absence of data, but there are important differences. Undefined is the default value for a variable that hasn't been assigned any other value, meaning it hasn't been defined yet. It's also assigned to functions that explicitly don't return anything and to non-existent properties of objects. In general, this value is automatically assigned by the interpreter during script execution. On the other hand, null is an explicit indication of no value, used when the developer intentionally specifies the absence of data. In other words, it's used to explicitly show that a variable or an object property has no meaningful value. What is hoisting? Hoisting is a mechanism that moves function and variable declarations to the top of their respective global or local scope. This is a feature of the JavaScript engine. JavaScript first declares variables and functions, then initializes them. This means that variables declared with var, as well as functions defined using function declaration, can be accessed even before they are actually declared. In the example with var, if we try to access the variable a before it's assigned, we get undefined. With ES6, we now have the ability to declare variables using let and const. Unlike var, these variables are not hoisted. So, if we try to access them before initialization, we get a reference error. As for functions, declarations made with function declaration can be placed at the end of the script and we can call them from anywhere in the script. In JavaScript, there are three logical operators. AND, represented by the words double ampersand, OR, represented by the words double vertical bars, and logical NOT, represented by the exclamation mark. The AND operator, double ampersand, finds and returns the first false value, or the last operand, if all values are true. The OR operator, double vertical bars, finds and returns the first true value. Both operators use short-circuiting to avoid unnecessary calculations. This means that as soon as the operator finds a matching value, no further checks are performed. This can be clearly seen in examples. In the first example, as soon as a false value is encountered, it is immediately returned. In the second example, several values are checked. A number, an empty object, which is considered true, and a string is returned because it's the final value in the chain. In the last example, even though there is a true value, true, as soon as null is encountered, it's returned because it's the first false value. With the OR operator, it's simple. 
As soon as the first true value in the chain is found, it is returned. Timer types in JavaScript. In JavaScript, there are two main types of timers, set timeout and set interval. Set timeout allows you to execute a given function once after a specified time has passed. Set interval allows you to repeatedly execute a function at regular intervals. Both timers accept two arguments, the function to be executed and the time in milliseconds. It's also important to note that both timers return an identifier, which can be saved in a variable. This identifier can then be used to cancel the timer with either the clear timeout or clear interval functions. Clear timeout allows you to stop a timer created with set timeout before the function is executed. This scenario is quite rare because if the timer is cancelled before the function is called, the result of the code won't be visible. Clear interval is the only way to stop a timer created with set interval. If you don't stop it, the timer will keep running until the browser tab or page is closed. So, understanding how to use clear timeout and clear interval properly helps you manage function execution efficiently in JavaScript. And now for the practical task. You need to create a function that takes a sentence and returns the shortest word in it. Let's create a function and name it find short, which will take a string as input. As mentioned earlier, when working with strings, you'll most likely need to convert them into an array, and that's exactly what we'll do first. We'll pass the space character to the split method. This is necessary so we can split the sentence into words, rather than individual characters. Next, we need to sort the resulting array in ascending order. To do that, we'll use the sort method, sorting by the length of each word. Finally, we return the first element of the sorted array. It will be the shortest word. The other two versions are just more advanced implementations. In one, we chain methods together, skipping the assignment of intermediate results to variables, and in the other, we additionally use ES6 syntax. That's it for today. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you won't miss the next episodes. And don't forget to show your support with a like for my efforts. See you in the next video. Bye.